Part, part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1 You have just arrived at the student hostel where you will live during the term. The manager is explaining the rules and another student is asking questions. Listen to the conversation and complete the form. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Excuse me, I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's $2.50. It used to be $2. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still $3. Does dinner still cost $3? Yes, it does. We've managed to keep the prices down this year, but the best deal is the three-meal plan for $48 per week. We give you vouchers to present when you come into the cafeteria, and you get 21 meals for your $48. That works out to a little more than $2 a meal. The two-meal plan is also at last year's rates of $36 per week. We give you vouchers for that too. My sister was in this hostel before me. I'm sure the hours for breakfast used to be longer. Yes, they were. They used to be 7 to 9.30, but to keep our expenses down, we made them 7 to 9. Lunch is the way it was, though. Hold on, dinner, 6 to 7.30, isn't that a change? Yes, it is, and in fact the form is wrong. It used to be 5.30 to 7.30, but now it's 6 to 8 p.m. 6 to 8 p.m., that's good. So, which plan would you like? I'd like to think about it, please. I need to check my lecture schedule. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Can you tell me how to get to my room, please? Of course. You're in the new wing, which is very freshly painted and pleasant. But I'm afraid you're going to have to go to a couple of other offices before you can have the key. You're in the admissions office now. Leave this office and turn right and go to the end of the hall. The last office is the fees office, where you can pay the balance of your room deposit. They'll give you a receipt. OK. After you've been to the fees office, come back past admissions. You'll see a very large room at the northwestern corner of the building. You can't miss it. That's the student lounge, and if you go in there, you can meet some of the other students and see who'll have a room near you. That's good. Can I get a cup of coffee there? Yes, there's a vending machine in the corner. Then go to the key room, which is opposite the lift and next to the library. Show them your receipt and you can pick up your key there. My luggage was sent on ahead. Do you know where I should collect it? The box room is next to the women's toilet. You'll have to get the key from the key room. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next on the itinerary is the aquarium. Depending on how long we spend at the museum, we might have to give this one a miss. It's not what I'd call a highlight of the day, but it would be a shame if we didn't get to see it, as it's en route to the Solheim Country Club, where we're booked in for lunch at one o'clock. Originally, we had planned to stop off at the Milltown Winery afterwards, but we've had to scrap that plan, otherwise we'd never get to the zoological gardens before closing time. We have pre-booked the gardens and must be there by 2.30, so no dilly-dallying please after lunch. Straight back onto the bus. The gardens close at 3.30, so we've an hour there which should give us ample time to look around. Time allowing, we'll stop off at the famous Stout Brewery after that, if traffic isn't too heavy, and we're in Lincoln before 5. If not, we'll head straight for the National Concert Hall, where you're in for a real treat of an evening, with a performance from the world-renowned cellist Andrei Borovsky. We have to be in our seats by 6.30 sharp. After that, it's back to the hotel for the night where a buffet meal will be waiting for us at half eight, or whenever we get back. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, is giving advice to a younger student, called Joanne, on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Mm. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters? Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. OK. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> But if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library, mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. Maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable. Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out 15 instead of the usual 10 books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do. But I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh, yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Dr Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month. Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah. 
but I suppose I can get a lot of support from course mates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out, what the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. OK. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a talk on cat breeds. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Look at her, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't she beautiful? The Abyssinian is a natural breed of cat which originated in Africa, or more specifically, what is now Ethiopia. Today it is found in much of the surrounding African continent, particularly Somalia. Its head is broad and moderately wedge-shaped, and it has relatively large pointed ears, like the specimen you can see here in front of you. It is typically a reddish colour and is known for the unusual M-shaped marking which often appears directly above the two eyes. See here. It has a medium length coat in a sort of ticked pattern, ticked being a term to describe when the hair gets progressively darker from root to tip. There you go little fellow, well done. Now this gentleman, he is a male, I can assure you, is the Aegean. The Aegean is of Greek origin, as you might have guessed, and is thought to have come from the Cycladic Islands. It's considered to be the only native Greek breed of cat. It is one of the newest and therefore rarest cat breeds, but relatively plentiful throughout Greece. It is much liked for its intelligence and friendliness, and because it excels in pest control. It has a semi-long-haired coat with rich tail. The coat is typically bi or tricolored, with white always present, and the other colors ranging from black to red, blue cream, etc. These colors are just as likely to present themselves as stripes. This little guy, as you can see, has beautiful reddish-blue stripes running through a pale coat. The head is medium-sized and quite round. The ears have a wide base, rounded tips, and are covered by hairs. Now the Australian, 
Australians are still mainly confined to distribution in their homeland. Obviously Australia, though a number of catteries in the UK have started to breed them too. Look at those expressive eyes. The cat is a fine example of the breed, medium-sized and short-haired. Notice also the large round head. This breed is much loved for its tolerance of children and because it is very rarely inclined to scratch. Its coat is typically spotted or, as in the case of this little fellow, classic tabby style. Last but not least, we have the bobtail, another relatively new breed, like the Aegean and Australian. The bobtail first appeared in the 1960s in the United States, the only country in which it has a significant distribution, and is most notable for its stubby, bobbed tail, which is only something like one-third to one-half the length of a normal cat's tail. It is a very sturdy breed with rather shaggy and dense fur. Bobtails can have any colour fur and often have the appearance of a tabby. Unlike the other breeds we have discussed, the bobtail is not natural. It is said to be a result of the crossbreeding of a domestic tabby cat and a bobcat. Such is the careful breeding the cat has undergone that it comes in all colours and there are also both long and short-haired versions. If I had to recommend one of these breeds to you today, I would have to vouch for the Australian. After all, as all of us here are parents, we must surely agree that our children are our first consideration when it comes to purchasing a pet. What effect the animal will have on them? How will it react? Etc. These are questions we all ask ourselves and they are even more important when the child is very young. The Australian is simply unrivaled in the temperament department and is extremely unlikely to lose its composure and take a swipe at your child. That said, it is still a very rare breed in these parts and as with all things in the world, rare equates to very expensive. So it may be beyond the price range some of you are prepared to pay. Surprisingly, perhaps, Though the bobtail is part lynx or bobcat, as they say in the States, it doesn't appear to have inherited any of the wildcat's aggressiveness, and therefore it makes an excellent second best as a pet you can allow to be around children. It is also considerably less expensive. The other two breeds we have talked about both make excellent house pets. However, hand on heart, I could not endorse either as a pet to have around young children. In my view, the child's safety is not something to gamble with. So, if you can afford the extra few quid to lay out for a bobtail, or better still, an Australian, do so. You won't regret it. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.